$15 billion. And here with us now is CEO and co-founder Jason Kelly. Jason, congratulations and thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Morgan. Happy to be here. So given the fact that we are seeing this broader downdraft within tech and, and growth names, not only today, but in recent weeks, not to mention the uh, increased scrutiny by the SEC towards SPACs, why the decision to go public today and why or to, to announce to go public and to do so via a SPAC? Yes, the major reason for us was velocity, right? You know, the uh, doing a IPO process in general, you know, takes your whole executive team out of the game for, you know, six months or so. Uh, and we wanted to get there faster. We really liked the folks at, at Soaring Eagle. They, they've been around the block, been doing this for a decade. So we were able to do it real quick. We did a pipe in uh, about two weeks, uh, raised 775 million into that with great investors, uh, Bailey Gifford, Morgan Stanley, ARC, uh, folks like that. Um, and so we're really excited. I think it's a, a faster way to get back to building the business. So in terms of the capital you raise, how will you deploy that? Yeah, so, so Ginkgo's business is, you know, we program cells kind of like you'd program a computer. Right. So, so if you've had, you know, an mRNA vaccine, you know, that's a piece of RNA code. It's ATCs and Gs, not zeros and ones, but your cells read it. They make a little protein. They turn your immune system on. Well, what Ginkgo has, you know, here, here in Boston, is about 200,000 square feet facility to, to read and write that DNA code. And we work with companies, you know, have a hundred million dollar joint venture uh, with Bayer Crop Science. We work with Roche and antibiotics. We did a project with Moderna last March around on the vaccine supply chain side. You know, it, it, we're, we're like an AWS for programming biology. Uh, and this really feels like the right moment to, to bring that out in the world. People have biology on the mind. It's an interesting metaphor. But so I guess really instead of custom software that you're creating for companies, it's really these custom genomes, if you will. How does the actual yeah. business model work? How are you making money on this? Is this about specifically the IP? Is it something else? Yeah, so, so what we do is we really uh, have two ways of bringing in revenue. One is while we're doing a project for a customer, they pay us on a usage basis. Think like using an Amazon data center. You pay them for compute. You pay us when our robots move to program that cell for you. That's the first way. And then second, when we're done after, say, a one to three year project, we do a value share. Like, um, you know, think like Apple App Store, uh, a, a reach in to revenue either through a royalty or in lieu of a royalty um, equity in the company. And so those are the two uh, big revenue streams for us. And today, the majority of our revenues, uh, you know, we're projecting 150 million in revenue in, in 21, up 95% from last year. That's largely in the foundry revenue coming from usage. But in the future, there's an enormous opportunity for bioengineered cells. You know, McKinsey projects two to four trillion dollars uh, for cell applications in the future. Uh, I think ultimately it'll be bigger than, than apps and computers. Jason, you, you mentioned the $150 million in revenue and your foundry billable revenue for 2021 at about $100 million. You see that increasing tenfold over the next four years to, let's call it, $1.1 billion by 2025. What gives you the confidence that you can ramp revenues to that extent? Yeah, so, so the great thing is the, the kind of work we do is actually already done out at biotech companies today. It's just done by people with my background. So I did a PhD in MIT in bioengineering. You want to get one of those? It's about five years of moving liquids around a lab bench by hand. We take that work and we move it on to robotics, drop the cost with scale. Well, you know, today in that industry, you know, last year, there's a, a nice Piper report, spent about $33 billion on that kind of work. And so what we're doing is migrating that. Think, think like um, going from on-prem servers and IT to cloud. There is that existing spend. So out of that 33 billion, you know, as you're mentioning, only 100 is coming to us right now. So, so, so there's a real opportunity for growth there. It's, it's just the first inning. Uh, you mentioned, of course, Soaring Eagle. It's Harry Sloan. They've had a good track record. But I would note uh, the SPAC is trading below 10. There is always the possibility that uh, shareholders reject the deal or at the very least it's more than expected sort of redeem, which reduces your overall capital. Is that a concern to you? Uh, not, not a concern for me now, no. I mean, we, we brought in really great folks in the pipe. Obviously, you know, it's a, a very tough time in the markets at the moment. So I think that's part of what you're seeing. Uh, and one of the things I like about it is if you look at who came in, you know, it, it's all folks that are long term bets, right, on, on Ginkgo. And, and that's how we really see the company. We're trying to build sort of an Amazon scale company over the long term. Those are the people I want on the cap table anyway. I think a lot of that frothiness of people just chasing SPACs to get a quick flip uh, has sort of gone out of the market. And I'm, I'm pretty happy to see that, to be honest. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.